So Psalm 139 is a good one to look at. I only have a couple of verses here, but it says in the Passion Translation, Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every movement of my heart and soul, and you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. You read my heart like an open book. Can you say that with me? You read my heart like an open book. That's a good thing to remember. So if you think you're hiding something from him, the way you might hide it from a coworker or something, he knows already. He's just waiting for you to come to him and say, can you help me deal with this? And the answer is always yes. Uh, verse 13, you formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside. I like the way that's said, right? We are fearfully and wonderfully made is the way it says it in the King James Version. And, and it's just the creation of, of the heavens. When, when you get back to that psalm, and, and he says, when I consider the stars and, and how big the whole thing is, but then when I look at an infant out of the mouths of babes, it still flows worship. What David was realizing is that child is just as much of a miracle as, as the galaxies are. And we forget that. You see the depths of my heart and you still love me the same. You created that whole thing up there that we can't even fathom, and yet you care that much about me too. What is man that you are mindful? Well, what we are is made in his image. Spectacular creation. C.S. Lewis said, you've never met an average person. Every person you've ever met is a miracle of God. I'm kind of paraphrasing him. But it's really hard to remember that sometimes, isn't it? Man, I don't know if you remember, but we had a guy come to the old church, Bishop Wilson. He did one of the men's conferences, and he was 94 years old. Still dressed really sharp, still spoke really well. I don't know, Eddie, do you remember? And he said, I found out in life that there's a little bit of God in everybody you meet. Some people you just have to look a lot harder than others to find them. <laughs> See, like that's a great thing to remember. So it might take you years to find that little piece of God that's in there, but they're made in his image, right? He learned a lot in that 94 years, right? Shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside, and you wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. <laughs> now, most men are not thanking God for making their wives so mysteriously complex. <laughs> but, but when we're talking about trying to help people grow and heal from wounds that they have, that's what we're saying often. I kind of coined that phrase here is, Lord, give me the combination to the lock of their heart. Like, show me what the complexity is and where this is, because you don't want them suffering any longer than they have to. And if we're effective ministers of the gospel and we're filled with your spirit, you know what they need. So help me get out of the way and speak through me and to them, and, and then let me hear when they talk to me what the real issue is underneath it all, because the goal is they walk out of here different than when they, when they walked in. They leave that addiction behind. They leave that hatred, that bitterness behind. Whatever it is, that bitter root judgment, we repent of it, and we move on. And it says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he removes that transgression. When you honestly repent, 1 John 1, 9, right? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from whatever the iniquity was that was attached to that thing. It's almost too good to be true, right? But it's your decision, and it takes some discipline to do this, right? Everything you do, he says, David, is marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it. It's what we just sang. Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Okay? Anybody see the movie by Lee Strobel called The Case for Christ. This was the verse that, the, that the, the nurse, the woman, said this is what you should pray for your husband because Lee Strobel was a really hardened atheist and he was fighting it. And she just kept praying this over. Lord, you said you would give him a heart of flesh for the heart of stone that he has. If you haven't seen that movie, I really recommend you, you get it. It's excellent. It's so well done. So in order for us to have true fellowship with others and with God, he has to pierce or melt our hearts of stone. It's easy to live behind the walls of the fortress that you build. You feel very safe, but you're not growing. And the only way for us to really grow in God is that we've got to come out from behind that fortress and we've got to start taking our armor off, right? It protects us, but it also prevents us. In our fallen condition, we're like medieval knights, <laughs> in armor, 
peering out through the slits in our helmets, and we're slashing and poking at one another, secretly wishing that the other person would open up so we could really meet them, okay? Now, I'm just going to say, as a general rule in my life, what I've experienced is women tend to let their guard down much faster with each other when they're friends. <laughs> if they don't like each other, man, they could drop some bombs. They could cut you with a knife so sharp you don't even know you've been stabbed <laughs> till you start seeing the blood. All with words, right? All with words. But when they like you, all of a sudden, like, they just open right up. When they, when they trust you, they'll just start really connected. Men, man, they got to go on four hunting expeditions, three fishing trips, <laughs> ten football games, and maybe you'll get a grunt, you know, of, yeah, that bothered me too, you know. <laughs> That's totally wrong for me to say that, you know. I'm, I'm totally exaggerating it. I'm just saying, though, there are different things about the way we were made up in our temperaments that do make it harder for men to just be honest about things because the culture has pounded us that if you show any flaws, you're weak. You have to be able to man up. What does that mean, man up? It means get ready to get physical with somebody if they get in your face. That's what's expected. You get picked on on the playground just to see what you're made of. You get onto a new job on a construction site, they're gonna rip you for a while just to see how, how hard is this guy willing to push back? And can we depend on him? If we get in a jam, can we depend on him? Remember uh, Hacksaw Ridge? How wrong were they about him? Totally wrong. He was the bravest guy in the crew, even though they thought, because he didn't want to carry a gun, that he was going to hurt them, end up saving half their lives. So you're wrong with your first impression sometimes, right? You get that? So then it says, to best understand how hearts of stone relate to inner vows, think of the heart of stone as a walled fortress. Life goes on inside, but access is very limited and well guarded. Many try to scale the walls. Most are picked off by the skilled defenders. Do you get the analogy? We've learned all these tools will let you get just so close enough, but then all of a sudden the drawbridge goes up. Or that... that Soldier on the on the wall picks you off with a with an arrow, and you're like, oh boy, I don't know why I touched something there. I better not go back there anymore. Those who persevere, wanted to minister to the pain and loneliness inside, often find that I love this. Their scaling ladders are roughly pushed away from the walls. <laughs> right? I'm trying to get in, but I can't get in. Every time I get halfway up the ladder, I find myself on my back again because you keep pushing the ladder away. And, and that, look, it's been a long time since people have been in there. So they're, they're embarrassed to let you in and, let, and you know the truth. And that's another huge problem in our culture now, shame. Everything is a shame thing. Like, you, you can't make any mistakes online without getting a 1,000 replies and people retweeting the mistake that you make. It used to be when we were just with our friends. You made a mistake, okay, you'd get, they'd get you for a while, but they'd forget about it and you'd move on because we all make mistakes, right? Not, not that way anymore. And then it says some may even be invited in, but when they get too close, they will be thrown off the wall <laughs> and barred from the real life inside. So that's, that's the heart of stone is the fortress. And then he's saying inner vows, on the other hand, are the armor that we wear in the hope that it will protect us and empower us. Since, however, it was forged from judgments. Okay, see how the different topics are starting to connect now? saying that the armor that you're wearing is formed by the judgments and forged in the fire of your judgment. I can't trust people. They're not trustworthy. And that's the armor that I have on. But it says because of that, it chafes against us constantly, and it actually attracts more hurt and abuse. How ironic is that? The law of sowing and reaping. You become the very thing you hated when there's a judgment in your heart. Easter's not in her head. How many times have we seen it, Easter? I swore I'd never be like my father. I'm just like my father. I swore I'd never be like my mother. And my four-year-old said something the other day, and I was like, oh, that's my mother in my four-year-old. I'm laughing because you have to keep a sense of humor about this, right? That's probably a sign that there's a judgment somewhere. And the very thing you didn't want, because you judged, now you're bound to reap that thing. Because whatever you sow, you're going to reap. <laughs> 